Let me go back to the text where he gave me the. That's all I. That's all I need to know. So closing. Thank you. That's the real mic now. It's a nice tie, Mr. Mayor. It's a nice tie. <clears throat> Right, and with that dramatic introduction, <laughs> I'm going to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order on October the 21st at 7 o'clock, and I certainly want to welcome everyone here tonight, and also all of those who might be uh, at home watching our proceedings on television. And now I'd like to ask you if you would please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. I'm going to um, ask Councilmember Freeman if she would do the honors tonight on the pledge to the flag. I'm not sure that Councilmember Reese, given the state of his... Uh, physical health tonight, and we'll be able to do it. So Council Member Freeman, would you please lead us? Thank you. I would be honored. <laughs> it is your practice to do so, if you would please stand. I pledge of allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. No problem. Uh, and Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council Member Alston. Here. Council Member Caballero. Here. Council Member Freeman. Present. Council Member Middleton. Here. And Council Member Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. And now we're going to begin our ceremonial items. And our first ceremonial, ceremonial item tonight it's a proclamation for the sister cities of Durham Week. Mm -hmm. And I would like Bob Ashley to please come forward, Bob, and I see Brady, and there may be others who you would like to bring up with you. <laughs> yep, come on up. And uh, I'm going to read this proclamation, present it to you, and uh, Bob, if you have a few words to offer, uh, we'd be delighted to, to have them. Whereas Sister Cities of Durham, Inc. is celebrating its 30th anniversary, being founded in 1989 with Sister Cities partners Durham, England, Kostroma, Russia, and Toyoma, Japan, and whereas Sister Cities has expanded Durham's international family by adding Arusha, Tanzania in 1991, Zhuzhou, China in 2012, Kunshan and Zaning, China as friendship cities in 2013 and 2017, Kavala, Greece in 2017, and Tilaran, Costa Rica, Celaya, Mexico, and Sibiu, Romania in 2019. And whereas Sister Cities has a variety of exchange programs with our international partners in the areas of education, business, medicine, art, music, local government, and environment, which have provided many opportunities for citizens' organizations in Durham to enhance their international understanding and to develop friendships around, their, around the world. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 19th to 27th, 2019, as Sister Cities of Durham Week in Durham, and hereby commend its observance to our citizens. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this 21st day of October, 2019. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On behalf of Sister Cities of Durham, I want to thank you for the proclamation. We're grateful to you, to all of the council members, and to the staff for the strong support for our mission in fostering grassroots citizen diplomacy. We are continually honored 
to showcase our diversity to delegations from our sister cities abroad. And thank you very much for this proclamation and for, again, for your support. Thank you. It's been a great year for sister cities. We've added three sister cities, and as the proclamation says, and it's been a very great year, a lot of wonderful work on behalf of the folks that do that, and thank you so much. Second, we're going to have a recognition, a very special recognition, uh, presented to Fire Captain Stephen Witt, Fire Driver Mario Herrera, Firefighter Todd Hoffman, uh, and the folks from Jamie's Dream. If, the, if you all could please uh, join me up here, uh, that would be great. Come on up. And I believe Natasha Murray is here from Jamie's Dream. Great. <clears throat> Great. Come on up. Do you have anyone else you would like to come up with you? I have Lorenzo and his family. Fantastic. Here. Fabulous. Come on up. <laughs> Wonderful. Super. So, we have a very special presentation tonight uh, for our fire department. And I'm going to uh, introduce... Natasha Murray from Jamie's Dream, who's going to describe Jamie's Dream and, and, uh, and the work that they've been doing. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Natasha, and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Natasha Murray. I represent Jamie's Dream Team. It's a nonprofit organization out of Pennsylvania. Jamie's Dream Team um, helps folks that have life-threatening disorders, disabilities, um, that really just need a helping hand. Our mission is to offer hope when there's little to ease the burden caused by serious injury, disability, trauma, or catastrophic events. In July, I received a call from Jamie about little Lorenzo here. Lorenzo has a disorder called ALD, <laughs> genetic disorder. His two brothers have this disorder as well, and they have since passed. Um, Lorenzo's dream was to have a tree house built where he can just be a kid and have fun and maybe grieve his brothers and just have a space of his own. I reached out to the Durham Fire Department and they came in so strong. A project that was supposed to take two months took half the time. They came every day and helped build this amazing tree house for Lorenzo. He has a TV, he's got video games, he's got a bed, he's got a little deck, he's got everything he needs to just have a great time and be a kid and maybe grieve his brothers in times of need. So I wanted to thank the Durham Fire Department for all of their efforts during this time. It was truly amazing, everything that you did every day to help us with this dream. With that, I'd like to present to you this plaque, which cute little Res Lorenzo's face on it. <laughs> to say thank you so much for everything. I think, I think Chief Yanazi wants to get everybody's picture. Y'all stand up here with Lorenzo in front. Let's get that plaque out there. Why don't you hold it, Lorenzo? There you go. Why don't you hold it for me? Thank you guys so much. Lorenzo, come on up here for a minute. I have a question for you. You have two brothers? Yes. Are you going to let your brothers play in the treehouse? Yes. Good job. Okay, thanks a lot, man. I'm going to also read the names of any other fire department staff who've participated in the project. If any of them are here, if you would please call, stand when I call your name. From Engine 13, Jonathan Lease, Jason Mask, Marcus Pereira, Thomas Scazafava, and Sean Walls. From Ladder 17, Greg Farrell, John Whitfield, James Fields, Wade Olive, Don Smith, Adam Morris, Spencer Hamlet, N. Holman, Scott Rapalea, David Lynn, Benjamin Schaefer, Mario Herrera, 
I'm sorry, this is from Engine 17, Mario Herrera, Zachary Griffith, Morgan Nelson, John Wilkerson, and Christopher Bain. From Ladder 3, Stephen Witt, Gray Holloman, Corey Kelly, and Cole Lemoyne, Lamone, I'm sorry. Engine 8, Walter Morris, Shannon Scott, and Christopher Burris. Engine 9, Daniel Morgan, Jeffrey McMillan, Brian Tumalak. From Engine 1, Benjamin Stalls and Richard Chavis. Squad 1, Todd Hoffman, and Squad 4, Annie Alvarez. And I just want to thank all of those folks. It, it, you can see how committed our fire department was to making this happen. And uh, this is just a wonderful project. And again, congratulations to those fire department members who are here. We really appreciate you. We're now going to have another very special presentation. And this is going to be the induction of our Durham, uh, induction of our Durham Youth Commission. And if we could, let me just grab my notes here. One of, one of the great things about doing this job is that people really tell you exactly what to do. And if I will just follow my directions, I can do it well. <laughs> and I have here before me uh, the information about how we're going to do the Durham Youth Commission induction tonight. We have a very special ceremonial item. Uh, and I always love this. This is always one of the most enjoyable ceremonial items that we have every year was the induction of our 2019-2020 Durham Youth Commission. Uh, since its inception in 2005, the Durham Youth Commission has been a place for young people to engage our local government through service learning and volunteerism and develop good civic leadership. Today, the Durham Youth Commission challenges Durham to go beyond the idea of young people as just recipients of programs and services and embrace a new partnership where young people are co-leaders co-decision makers, and co-creators in our growth and development as a community. When youth are engaged and share power in the city's decision-making processes, everyone benefits. The Durham Youth Commission strives to be an example of authentic youth engagement in Durham. It is the goal of the commission to be a representative body of the diverse lived experiences of youth in Durham while continuing to acknowledge and amplify the voices of youth who are not currently represented. This year, we have 14 DYC members representing eight high schools across Durham. The DYC will work with the Office on Youth to develop new platforms for young people to share their experiences and the issues that are important to them with elected officials and Durham decision makers. The DYC will also continue to build strong relationships with other youth groups across the city and state. So at this time, I'd like to invite DYC inductee Leslie Gonzalez to come to the microphone and share on behalf of the Durham Youth Commission. Leslie? And as Leslie does this, I'm going to ask all the members of the Youth Commission if you all would come up and join us here uh, on, the, uh, on the dais. Come on up. Um, hi, everybody, um, and hello, city council members. Uh, my name is Leslie Gonzalez. I go to Northern High School, and I am a senior. And the spoken word that I'll be sharing with you all today is called 15 Things You Should Know About Watching Your Neighborhood Become Gentrified. And that's how it starts, too. So 15 things you should know about watching your neighborhood become gentrified. Number one. First, you wake up one morning and everything looks just fine. Number two, you wake up the next and everything's flipped within the blink of an eye. Number three, one house starts to change, then that family goes bye-bye. Number four, hire the right contractor because construction is gonna last a while. Number five, more houses on the block seem to start getting bought. Number six, even old folks from the east side get surprised. Number seven, the rich don't just drive by, but now they park their cars in the houses right beside, and I'm not playing because my neighbor drives a Tesla. Number eight, property taxes go up. Now my folks' rent is so high. Number nine, affordable housing isn't affordable if my friend's mom needs three jobs just to survive. Number 10, you live in the east side and your car breaks down. Now you don't got to drive. 11. At least there's not as many gunshots in the middle of the night or even in the summertime. 12. 
You're only 16, so they don't want to hear your cries. Supposedly, we don't know enough about this life. 13. We live around the crime. Man, our minds are already doing time. Y'all require us to go to school, but see, I taught myself how to rhyme. 14. Watch as time flies by. Less and less cops will ride around at night because fear feeds their intuition to do what's right. 15. All the little things that coincide with the white man pushing our needs aside is all the more reason why you and I should fight. And that's just 15 things you should know about watching your neighborhood become gentrified. Mm. And if that isn't enough to show you why we got to be tough, let me give you one more reason to really start. Have you ever heard those people who start yelling with pride like, Hey, let's go, Bull City, and they rep the 919. Well, let me tell you about these people who only rep Durham post-gentrified. They're just chasing clout. Watch them follow the hype. They don't care about your city, and we're just not their type. Use your intuition to speak up, because it's not right. Let's not lose any more homes to the rich and the white. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, so there's some <laughs> powerful testimony, folks. If you want to know what the Durham Youth Commission's all about, it's a lot of truth-telling. Very powerful testimony, Leslie. That was fabulous. So I'm now going to ask, beginning with Leslie, if you all could each come here to the mic and just tell us your name, your school, your grade, and the, your term on the Durham Youth Commission. Can I have all of you all do that? Okay, Leslie, why don't you go first? So my name is Leslie. Um, I'm a senior at Northern High School. This is my first term on the Durham Youth Commission. And we were all supposed to also come up with a word that defines us. And I think mine would be bold. Hey, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm a senior at Jordan High School. This is my first term in the Durham Youth Commission. And I'm an artist. Hi, I'm Laura McDowell. This is my first term on the Durham Youth Commission. I am a sophomore at Carolina Friends, and my word is that I'm an activist. Hi, my name is Ashley Padilla Ayala. Um, I go to City of Medicine Academy, and I'm a sophomore there. Um, this is my first term, and a word I would use to describe me is a communicator. Uh, I'm Susanna King. I'm a junior at Durham School of the Arts, and this is my first term in the Durham Youth Commission, and I'm a listener. Hi, my name is Henry Cruz Reyes. I'm a senior at City of Medicine Academy. Uh, this is my second year on the commission, and a word to describe me would be unafraid. Uh, hi, my name is CJ. Um, I'm a freshman. I go to DSA, this is my first term, and my word would be unique. Hi, my name is Rebecca Sosby. I'm a sophomore at Durham School of the Arts, and my word would be risk taker. Hi, I'm Julia Haas. I'm a junior at Insight Co-Learning Center, and I am a historian. Hello, my name is Asa Patterson. I am a sophomore at Durham School of the Arts. This is my first term in the DYC, and I'm a performing artist. Hi, my name is Anaga, and I'm a senior at Durham School of the Arts, and this is my second term, and a word that would describe me would be musician. Hello, my name is Fedora Para. I'm a junior at Insight Co-Learning Center. This is my first term in the Durham Youth Commission, and I am an innovator. Hello, my name is Helen. Um, this is my first term on the commission. I go to JD Clement Early College. I'm a freshman, and my word to describe me is different. Hello. My name's Mari Joof. I'm from Middle College. I'm a junior. 
Uh, this is my first year on the DYC, and a word to describe myself is an environmentalist. Thank you. Well, we have an awesome, fabulous uh, DYC group this year, and I'm going to ask my council colleagues if you all will join me down here, and let's all have our pictures taken so we can become famous one day from knowing these <laughs> young people. I'll wave. I'll wave. Squeeze it in. Hold on, we're going to get the official one. All right. <clears throat> and uh, we look forward to seeing a lot more of our youth commissioners this year. We have another proclamation tonight, uh, an important proclamation for Mammography Awareness Day. And I'm going to ask Susan Sharpless for Alpha Zeta Omega Chapter and uh, the president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority to please come up and anyone else that you might like to bring with you, Ms. Sharpless. Oh, here she comes. Good. Okay. And I'm going to ask Councilmember Vernetta Austin if she will do the honors uh, for the presentation of this proclamation. First fam, what up? <laughs> Whereas October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is dedicated to increasing public knowledge about the importance of early breast cancer detection. And whereas National Mammography Awareness Day is observed annually on the third Friday in October as part of National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, established during the presidency of William J. Clinton in 1993. And whereas October 18th, 2019 is the 26th anniversary of National, National Mammography Awareness Day. This day serves as a reminder to all women that mammograms are the best method of early detection of breast cancer. And whereas Alpha Kappa, Alpha, sorry, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated under the leadership of international president, Dr. Glenda Glover, is seeking to raise awareness on breast cancer through its 2018 2000 to 2022 international program, exemplifying excellence through sustainable service. And whereas, I'm going to get it right this time, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated encourages women ages 40 to 44 years to begin annual mammography screening and strives to help 100,000 women by sharing information concerning breast cancer and the risk factors that contribute to breast cancer. And whereas, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated launched the Alpha Kappa Alpha Mobile Mammography Unit on the campus of Texas Southern University, providing mammogram access to the uninsured. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Schul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 18th, 2019 as Mammography Awareness Day in Durham, and hereby encourage all healthcare services, hospitals, clinics, and insurance companies to deliver affordable options so that every woman at every income level will have easy access to mammograms and be informed on their risk for breast cancer through continuous screening. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll just say it's just a lot of pressure to have four AKAs like standing behind me while I try to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I am Susan Sharpless, and I'm the president of the Alpha Zeta Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Since 1928, so for over 91 years, the chapter has been an integral part of the Durham community. 
My sisters and I are deeply gratified and appreciative of the Durham City Council proclaiming October 18th, 2019 as Mammography Awareness Day in Durham. By doing so, you honor and lend support to our sorority's efforts to highlight the importance of mammography screening to the early detection and treatment of breast cancer. Breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among black women. An estimated 34,000 new cases are expected to be diagnosed in 2019. And over 6,500 deaths from breast cancer are expected to occur among black women this year. These statistics underscore how vitally important it is for women to begin annual screening mammography between the ages of 40 and 44. In addition to acknowledging <coughs> Mammography Awareness Day every October during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, our sisterhood joins in other <coughs> efforts focused on increasing awareness of breast cancer prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and fi funding research to find a cure for breast cancer. Some of the engagement activities this month include sharing information about the disease to educate our members and the community, encouraging members and friends to perform breast self-examination and schedule mammography mammograms annually. We also salute our breast cancer survivors in our chapter and encourage them to share their stories on social media. And we sponsor and serve as hostesses at Lincoln Community Health Center's Breast Cancer Awareness Workshop. In addition, earlier this year, we participated in the Coleman Walk for Cure here in the Triangle. Again, thank you for joining us and acknowledging Mammography Awareness Day this year and our ongoing efforts to combat, combat breast cancer. At this time, we'd like to share a pink ribbon which, with which each of the council members. <clears throat> and we would ask that you wear it for the rest of the month of October in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you so much, Ms. Sharpless, and to the members of the sorority uh, for this bringing us this very, very important awareness. Uh, and we just want to express our appreciation to you all for being here. So thank you. Our final ceremonial item tonight is for National Arts and Humanities Month, and I'm going to ask Sherry DeVries, Executive Director of the Durham Arts Council, and Jenny Levine, Humanities and Adult Programming Coordinator of Durham County Library, to please join me and anyone else that you all might uh, want to bring with you. I see you uh, have Connie and maybe Margaret as well. All right, great. Thank you. We're glad to have you all. And uh, joining me for this proclama proclamation, I will be uh, Council Member Caballero, who I believe is already here. Thank you all. Good evening. Thank you for being here with us. Whereas the arts and humanities enhance and enrich the lives of all Americans, positively affecting every aspect of life in America today, including the economy, social problem solving, job creation, education, creativity, and community livability, and whereas city and states through their local and state art agencies representing thousands of cultural organizations have celebrated the value and importance of culture in the lives of Americans and the health of thriving communities during National Arts and Humanities Month for several years, and whereas the humanities help diverse communities across the United States explore their history and culture with the support and partnership of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the 55 state and territorial humanities councils, libraries, local educational and cultural institutions, and whereas the arts and cultural industry also strengthens our economy by generating $166.3 in total economic activity annually, $26 billion in government revenue, and by supporting the full-time equivalent of 5 million jobs. And whereas the United States Conference of Mayors has actively participated in National Arts and Humanities Month since 1984, and whereas the nation's 95,000 nonprofit arts organizations, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the nation's 4,500 local arts agencies, the Arts and Humanities Council of the 50 states and the six U.S. jurisdictions have regularly issued official proclamations on an annual basis designating October as National Arts and Humanities Month. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 2019 as National Arts and Humanities Month in Durham and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance and to celebrate arts and culture in our community. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 21st day of October 2019. 
Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Shule and city council members for your support of the arts and for your recognition through this proclamation of National Arts and Humanities Month. I'm Sherry DeVries, Executive Director of the Durham Arts Council. As a special remembrance of Arts and Humanities Month, we are pleased to provide each of you with a CD from several very talented local musicians who have been recognized and supported in the Durham Arts Council Emerging Artist Program, including Al Strong, Annalise Stahls, Michael Gregoni, and Rissy Palmer. They are just a few of the over 600 emerging artists that have been recognized in that program. And I'd also like to recognize and thank Councilman Charlie Reese for serving on our Board of Trustees at the Arts Council. And I'm also pleased to thank and introduce the Board President of the Durham Arts Council, Dr. Constanza gomez Joins, who is also Executive Director of the Center for the Global Learner at Durham Technical Community College. Thank you, Sherry. Good evening. Good evening. Durham is home to nationally and internationally celebrated arts organizations and artists that express a vibrant personality and cultural traditions of Durham. The arts are helping to make Durham a highly desirable and livable city for businesses and residents. And the nonprofit arts sector in Durham also generates $154 million in annual economic activity. For 65 years, the Durham Arts Council has supported and developed the arts, showcasing and nurturing the creative talent in this community. The Durham Arts Council was an early leader in the community arts movement and was the first major arts organization to move downtown Durham in the late 1970s to help spur the revitalization and renaissance of our city. Today, Durham Arts Council serves over 400,000 people of all ages and showcases and supports the work of 2,000 artists and over 300 art and cultural organiza organizations each year. Last year, the Durham Arts Council provided $1.34 million in direct cash support to the arts sector through grants, arts commissions, and over 1,200 jobs. And we welcome 34,771 visitors to Centerfest, to Centerfest just last month. Thank you. Thank you again for the City of Durham's support in this proclamation. And I now would like to introduce Jenny Levine, Humanities and Adult Program, Programming Coordinator for the Durham County Library, representing the humanities aspect of this month-long celebration. Thank you, Connie. At the Durham County Library, we work to present humanities programming that appeals to those in our community who are interested in exploring art, history, film, literature, dance, philosophy, and ethics. In FY19, we hosted a total of over 6,000 programs and had over 145,000 attendees. We want to connect the community to challenging topics relevant to the people of Durham and to create a space for information and discussion. This means bringing in popular programs in partnership with the Durham Library Foundation about Durham's rich history, such as Home Movie Day, and popular presenters, such as the Family Friendly Drag Show, the Reader's Party, and presentations from our friends at the Nasher Museum, Playmakers Repertory Company, and the American Dance Festival, and many others. Also, the Durham Arts Council and Haytai Heritage Center have provided us amazing location support while Main Library has been under construction. On behalf of the Durham County Library, I thank you for this excellent honor for the arts and humanities. Thank you. Give one of you all this showcase. All right, uh, that concludes our ceremonial items. We had some great ones tonight. And uh, now I'm going to uh, proceed uh, with announcements by members of the council. Can I ask if any of my colleagues have any announcements at this point? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I uh, uh, want to uh, just express uh, deep uh, condolences and sorrow 
uh, over the tragedy that struck uh, over our skies on, on yesterday evening. A small plane on approach to RDU, as we all know, crashed and two lives were lost. RDU, of course, is our gateway to the world, our cultural gateway, our economic gateway. And uh, we certainly uh, want to commend all of the incredible work that first responders did and, and RDU staff did in working through the night uh, to recover, uh, to find uh, the wreckage and recover um, the lost souls um, from last night. So we, I just want to go on record commending those that work diligently. Um, multi agents. Uh, it was a multi-agency response, um, magnificent work across lines, city lines and agency lines, and I want to go on the record acknowledging their valiant efforts and send our condolences and prayers uh, to the Partridge family. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member, for that important uh, important statement of, of, of empathy and concern. Any other council members, any other announcements? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just wanted to take the opportunity to remind folks that early voting for the um, 2019 municipal election is open now. Um, there are four early voting sites that you can find on the Durham County Board of Elections website. And early voting will be open until November 1st. Um, that's a Friday, so there will not be early voting on the weekend before the general election, um, which will happen on November 5th. Just wanna um, encourage everybody to get out and vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem. Any other announcements? Just a special note that this will be the cycle where on election day, November the 5th, mm -hmm. that the uh, buses will be free. Thank you, yes. There will be free bus service from the city of Durham on election day. Thank you for that important reminder. I also have one announcement. Um, I believe for the eighth year, maybe the ninth, I'm a little bit unclear, but uh, I have sort of by accident, many years ago, I challenged, as when I first got on the city council, uh, city employees to a race. Uh, since that time, this is, uh, let's just say, mushroomed and um, is now part of the city's health and wellness plan. Now it is called Run with the Mayor although I don't know if you can call what I do exactly running anymore. <laughs> but we had a wonderful, wonderful uh, run with the mayor on Saturday. Uh, we had 64 of our employees participated, uh, 10 uh, spouses and friends, uh, 10 children of our employees. Uh, we, we have a five mile run and then other people run and walk and ride their bikes and go as far as they want. Uh, it was, uh, a fabulous day, and of course the weather was amazing. Uh, I did get to wear bib number 1869 to recognize the 150th birthday, not of me, I just want to be clear about that, <laughs> but of the city of Durham, uh, and uh, we're very proud of that anniversary. Um, I uh, want to list the people uh, that, that beat me in the race, okay? That's, that's the tradition, I'm going to read their names. Uh, first was Jason Botchert. I'm not sure if I'm saying uh, Jason's name correctly, uh, of Technology Solutions. Rob Damon of Neighborhood Improvement Services. Dana Horncole from Public Works. Deputy City Manager Bo Ferguson. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> chief, uh, Assistant Chief, Bob. Deputy Chief. Chris Yanuzzi of the fire department. Chris has gotten faster in recent years. Uh, Robert John from Transportations. John Scott from Human Resources. Sean Tuttle from Public Works. Paul Wiebke from Public Works. Um, also, uh, I, sh I should say the first three finishers. Robert John from Transportation in a time of 33-39. That's pretty good for five miles. <laughs> John Scott from Human Resources, and Jason Botchert from Technology Solutions. And also to beat me was, I will have to just say now, the fastest female in the city, Marielle Klein from the city manager's office. Congratulations to Marielle. I tried to keep up with her to no avail. <laughs> so it was a really fun day, and we'll do it again next year, uh, and look forward to having even more employees. <coughs> I want to thank uh, the folks that made it happen uh, from Human Resources, uh, Kiana Bailey, Gwendolyn Burnett, and 
Veronica Jackson and Drew Bullard all did a fantastic job, and also Department Director Regina Youngblood. It was a great day, a really fun event for the city and for all of us who were there, and I want to thank the folks that put it together. Okay, I've now humiliated myself enough for one evening. <laughs> this gets a little bit longer every year, Mr. Mayor. It does. I thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> now you've humiliated me with okay. Um, all I will say is I won my age group. <laughs> How many people were in that age group, Mr. Mayor? That would have been one, Councilman. <laughs> Good job, Mayor. Thank you, thank you. All righty, uh, and now we will move to priority items by the city manager. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. The city manager's office has no priority items. Thank you very much, Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. The attorney's office has no priority items. Thank you. Madam Clerk. And good evening, everyone. The city clerk's office has no items also. All right. Thank you very much. We'll now move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is items that the council has previously worked on. The consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Members of the council or members of the public can pull an item from the consent agenda, in which case it will be considered at the end of the meeting. <clears throat> item one, approval of city council minutes. <laughs> item two, mayor's nominee for appointment, Human Relations Commission. Item four, Durham City County Appearance Commission appointments. Item five, request to carry over funds from fiscal year 2018-19 to fiscal year 2019-20 budget and other budget ordinances. Item six, Vermilion Homestead LLC loan amendment for Vermilion Townhomes, 1311 Cook Road. Item seven, Southeast Regional Lift Station Contract 2 Project, <laughs> award of construction contract to J.F. Wilkerson Contracting Company, Inc. Item eight, that 2019 dam inspection and maintenance project, award of professional engineering services contract to Schnabel Engineering, I believe that's Schnabel Engineering, South PC. Item nine, amendment number three to the demolition of decommissioned wastewater treatment facilities contract, Item 10, 2019 Durham Water Management Roof Replacements Project, Award of Construction Contract to Baker Roofing Company. Item 11, Resolution Authorizing the City Auction. Item 12, Interlocal Agreement with Chatham County and the City of Durham Fire Department for Fire and Rescue Services. <clears throat> Item 13, Duke Energy Storm Resiliency Grant Award. Item 14, Additional Construction Services with Cadet Construction Company at Valley Springs Park. Item 15, Temporary Staffing. Item 16, Contract SW75 Public Works Operations Center Concrete Repairs 2019. Item 17, Contract Amendment to Contract SW44D with SEPI Engineering and Construction for Professional Services for Additional Design Services for SW44D Carpenter Fletcher Road Bike and Pedestrian Facilities Project. Item 18, Contract SW75C Request for Qualifications RFQ for Inspection Services for Various City Projects. Item 19, contract amendment to contract SW45D with Alta Planning and Design, Inc. for professional services for additional design services for SW45D, Cornwallis Road Bike and Pedestrian Facilities Project. You have now heard the consent agenda, and I'll accept a motion for its approval. Move for consent. Second. Move and second that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you so much. We'll now move to the general business agenda public hearings and begin with item 22, consolidated annexation high fox. And first we will hear uh, our report from staff. Good evening, I'm Emily Struthers with the planning department. I would like to state for the record that all planning department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law and affidavits of all notices are on file in the planning department. I will now present the High Fox Consolidated Annexation Case. Request for utility extension, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning <coughs> change have been received from Sean Gorman for 1.878 acres of land located at 1106 and 1107 High Fox Drive. The area is presently zoned residential rural and Falls Jordan Watershed Protection Overlay District B. Staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning district. Should the council act favorably, approval of the annexation petition and zoning would become effective on December 31st, 2019. City and council operational departments such as solid waste, fire, police, and EMS have reviewed this request and have not identified any significant negative service delivery costs or impacts. 
The Public Works and Water Management Departments perform the utility impact analysis for the two utility extension agreements tied to this rezoning and determined that the existing City of Durham Water and Sanitary Sewer mains have capacity to serve the project. The Budget and Management Service Department performed a fiscal impact analysis which determined that the proposed annexation will become revenue positive upon annexation. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into two utility extension agreements. The second is for the consistency statement, and the third is to adopt the zoning ordinance. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Struthers. You all have heard the report from staff, and I'm now at a declare this public hearing open, and I'm first I'm gonna ask if there are any questions for Ms. Struthers by members of the council. Hearing none, I'm gonna now uh, ask if there are members of the public who would like to speak to this item. I, I have no one who has signed up to speak to this item. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this item? Yes, please come forward. Evening. Uh, give us your name and address. Sean Gorman, 5011 you... South Park Drive. Here in Durham. Norman, are you speaking in favor of this item? I'm speaking in favor. I just want to uh, let, it known, let it be known that I'm here for any questions. Thank you very much. I would appreciate if uh, after the item is over, if you would uh, please go to the clerk's uh, desk and fill out a yellow card. That would be great. Thank you. All righty. Are there any questions for Mr. Mormon or by members of the council? Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? This is a public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. We will need three motions to approve this. First would be the adoption of the ordinance annexing High Fox into the city of Durham. So moved. The motion has been made that we uh, adopt the ordinance annexing High Fox. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. The second motion required will be to adopt a consistency statement as required by NCGS 160A383. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? <laughs> please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. And third will be the motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mormon. Uh, we'll now move, and thank you, Mr. Struthers. We'll now move to item 23, Brody Duke Warehouse Partial Repeal of Landmark Designation. And I'm going to uh, ask uh, for the report from staff. Welcome, Ms. Rosenberg. Good evening. I'm Carla Rosenberg with the Planning Department, and I'm here to present uh, case LD 19-0001. Um, which is a request for a partial repeal of landmark designation for the Brody Duke Warehouse. Um, this was received from Zach Spencer of Graystar for one parcel of land located at 311 Liggett Street, um, totals 1.46 acres. At the time of the landmark designation in 1999, the parcel encompassed more than three acres. Since that time, the southern portion of the parcel, not containing the primary structure, was paved over for parking. And this year, the owner subdivided the parcel into two lots, one containing the landmark structure and the other containing the parking lot. The present proposal is to repeal the landmark designation for the parcel containing the parking lot. The Historic Preservation Commission gave its recommendation 6-0 um, for approval on August 6, 2019, and the State Historic Preservation Office has issued a letter of recommendation on June 18, 2019. So staff is recommending approval of this request based on uh, the land no longer holding historical or archaeological significance and based on the fact that there is adequate land still surrounding the landmark structure to protect significant views of it from the street. Thank you, Ms. Rosenberg. You have heard a report from staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And I'll first ask if there are questions for Ms. Rosenberg by members of the council. Councilmember Freeman. I just wanted to um, clarify, what would be the land use designation for this lot if it were removed? The, um, it's, I believe it's D, D. Um, let's see. 
I do believe it's a downtown design um, district. It's a support one or two. I'm sorry, I don't have it written down ex specifically which, but it would be a downtown design. And what's allowed in support one and two? What is allowed to have up to six stories in height, um, and there's no um, like regulation on the actual use. It's more about form. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Ms. Rosenberg, just to confirm the memo, uh, the if we were to do this, uh, the tax break that the that the applicant has previously received on this property would be recovered. Is that correct? They would be. They would be. Re the preceding three years. Or preceding three years. That would be um, just over twenty seven thousand dollars. Okay, so the tax and and they've been receiving the tax break for how long? They've been receiving it since nineteen ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Well, the the parcel whoever has owned the parcel right. since that date. Not necessarily this owner, but correct. Okay, I'm not sure about the ownership history. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that's essentially 19 or 20 years of ownership. Uh, 19 or 20 years of, yes. Tax break. Whoever owned it, yes, of tax break. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll have some questions about that for the applicant. Um, is that, let me just ask you all around that again, Ms. Rosenberg, is that standard? We've done this before. We have d done this before, um, specifically the Venable Warehouse building um, on Pettigrew. Yes. That's the the only one to my knowledge that we've And done. did we have the same time period of the tax break recovery? I believe um, it was 2003 that that one had initially been um, designated, and then the repeal was in 2016, so a little less time. Did we also just require three years of recovery of the most yeah. recent taxes? Yes. Okay. Do you have any comment about why that's the chosen period of time? Um, I do not have that expertise. Um, I will check and see if somebody else might be able to answer that. Okay. Uh, good evening, um, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, Pat Young with the Planning Department. I have to confirm this, but I'm quite confident that that term is specified in state law. I I'm going to need to, to uh, pull up the state law because I don't think it was in the report, but I don't believe that was locally said. I believe that was that's statutorily dictated. I'll try to confirm that while this item is still under consideration. You agree with that, Ms. Rayburg, as far as you know? I have a feeling it's in the Machinery Act, yes. Okay. So you will confirm that as we're before we vote? Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Any other questions for staff before we, um, before we move to uh, members of the public? Okay, I'm going to now move to members of the public. Uh, we have two people who've signed up to speak on this item. Uh, the first is George Stanzial, uh, and the second is Brian Sherrick. Welcome, we're glad to have you here. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you each three minutes. If it turns out there's more need, uh, you will, you, you can have it. Thank you. I won't be long. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Mayor uh, Shul, members of council. My name is George Stanziel, 115 Cofield Circle <clears throat> in Durham. I'm president of Stewart, uh, representing the, uh, the applicant Measurement Incorporated, the owner uh, Measurement Incorporated. And I have here with me Mr. Brian Sherrick of measurement uh, in case there are any uh, questions. Um, I'll not belabor the, the report given by staff. We have been through a lengthy process to remove uh, this designation uh, from the surface parking lot a portion of the Brody Duke property with full support from SHPO as well as the Durham Preservation Commission and your staff. It was determined by all three that historic significance on this site did not exist. Uh, in subdividing the property, uh, we're leaving a 115-foot uh, parcel of land south of the building to preserve the view shed to the building. Uh, and the master plan for the Durham Innovation District uh, calls for this area to be developed as a public space connecting the Durham Beltline uh, to the west and ultimately uh, to Dentral, uh, Central Park, Durham Central Park uh, to the east. Uh, removing the designation of the remaining parking lot 
will allow for continued development of the Innovation District. Um, we're happy to answer any questions and would greatly appreciate your support. Thank you, Mr. Stanzial. Mr. Sherrick, welcome. If you could give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Sure. My name is Brian Sherrick, 3 West Haven Place here in Durham. I am with Measurement Incorporated and Director of Real Estate. I've come just to help answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much. All righty. I'm now going to ask if there's anyone else here who would like to speak at this, to this item. This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this item? Is there anyone here today? All righty. Hearing none, then I'm going to ask now uh, if council members have... Do you have a question? Please, co please come to the microphone and give us your name and address. I'm Marianne Maple Osterbrink, 500 Cobb Street, Durham, apartment 317. I just had a quick one that Miss Carla was talking about. It could be a six-story building, but then this gentleman was talking about per preservation and view shed and that, so I'm a little confused about what would go there, perhaps a, an apartment building or something like that. I'm just curious. Okay, thank you very much. And if when, when uh, this item's over, if you could go to the clerk's uh, desk there and fill out a card, that would be great. Thank you. I'm going to ask Mr. Stanzial if he would like to respond. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, the, the remaining parcel that includes the building also includes an area, a, a piece of the site south of the building um, that will be uh, left for view shed and also for public space. The rest of it, the, the new parcel that's been created on the parking lot will be the part that the designation comes off of. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. All right. Uh, I see someone else who would like to speak to this item. If you could please come forward and give us your name and address. Hello, my name is Katie Rose Levin. I'm at 4110 Cobblestone Place. Thank you. Uh, thanks. <laughs> I was just wondering, this is a, a parcel that is in a downtown area. It's very fully and comprehensively developed. And this particular place has a pretty good series of large street trees. There's also large trees within the parking lot itself. But if as you're walking around that location, it's one of the few places that does provide shade to some of these really hot areas. Uh, changing from what it is into a um, design similar to the surrounding areas would typically eliminate those trees. I'm wondering if there's been any consideration about preserving them as part of the new development. Thank you for the question. And if you would uh, fill out your card uh, after the item is over, that would be great. Mr. Stanzial or Mr. Sherrick? Um, I, it, it's hard. It's hard to say really at this point because a, a new development isn't hasn't been really designed. But um, any de, any new development that would go there would be required to provide street trees in accordance with the ordinances. So um, yes, there are, there are probably some large larger trees there uh, on the perimeter, not in the parking lot at all, on the perimeter, and those would have to be replaced. There were, I'm sorry, there were, there, the trees in the parking lot would have to be replaced because you're going to be building on the parking lot. The, the, the trees that are in the parking lot are on the perimeter. They're not in the parking lot. Okay. They're on the perimeter. Yeah. And um, my guess is that with any new development, they would have to be replaced you know, as part of the new development, and they would be replaced with street trees in accordance with the ordinance. Thank you. We'll be discussing the, that subject later tonight. All right. Uh, any other questions? Any questions for the uh, for the applicant or for staff? Any questions? Just for the sake of clarity, mm -hmm. I know that the, there was a young lady, the young lady that came up to ask about the height and noting. I just want to make sure that it's clear, like that there's up to six stories that they would be allowed within the form. But I think that uh, with the height, with the height of the historic structure. Is only a certain percentage is allowed to go over. So that's what they're talking about with the view. So it's not going to block. And it shouldn't overshadow that structure, if that helps, because I don't think that was clear. 
Yeah, that, that's correct. Those, that was discussed at length uh, at uh, the Historic Pres Preservation Commission meeting, and, um, and that's the reason for this additional piece of property that extends beyond the building. And it's 115 feet. Thank you very much. Any further questions? I'm here for Mike. Uh, uh, Council Member Middleton? Thank and you, then, uh, And then we'll get you, Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you uh, all for being here. The, um, I, I know fewer, more passionate gatekeepers in the historic preservation folk. The fact that you got the state and the local folk sign off on it is, is compelling to me. But I do, I do want to ask about the, just so I'm clear, the buffer, the, the green space is not incorporated into the buffer. It would be the buffer, then a green space, then uh, uh, the development. How, how much of the, that green space is, is, how much of the buffer is constituted by the green space, or is, that, is there a buffer and then linear park or green space, or could? Yeah, it, um, it's probably not appropriate to call it a buffer. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a certain distance from the building out to the, the new parcel line. Uh, and I thought the word was used, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I thought sorry. I heard the word used, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Go ahead. Well, the idea of, of pro providing that space is to is, is to allow views to the to the existing building that will uh, maintain the, the historic designation, and also to, to provide for uh, a pro an appropriate distance for a, a building that might be built that would be built there to not impose on the the existing structure. I wouldn't call it a buffer because it's not really a buffer. It's it's a it's a distance that has been de uh, determined uh, to create that view shed uh, between what will be the the new designated line uh, and the existing building. So I, I understand the purpose of the unimpeded sight line. My question is: You mentioned the green space, the uh, the park green space. Is that is that part of that? site or is that in addition to that 115 foot site uh, unimpeded site line no that the uh, the public space would be included in that site so it will it will go fairly close to the, the existing building and be part of you know it'll be a space that will occur from the front the face of the existing building to the face of any new building that was my question yeah thank you thank you council member uh, Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. The, the uh, staff report cites uh, North Carolina General Statute Section 105-2771, which is a relevant statute, but the time period for which taxes are uh, due to be uh, reimbursed to um, the local government is 105-278, and that does specify three fiscal years. So that is under state law. Three fiscal years. Thank you. I'm going to... Uh, suggest that our legislative, the Council Legislative Committee, uh, put that on our agenda for the next session. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Austin, I believe you're our Legislative Committee Chair. I'm making a note right now. And uh, I see Carmisha Wallace, our Senior Assistant to the City Manager. If you all would consider uh, putting this on our, I, I think it's problematic. Uh, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's problematic that our, we have, that folks have been getting a tax break for 20 years and we can only recover three years of those back taxes when the designation is lifted. There may be good reasons for that that I don't know, uh, but I would appreciate if we would put that on our legislative agenda for consideration uh, for, um, for the next session. And maybe Councilmember Middleton, you might want to find out if the legal cities is, uh, are the uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities has uh, thought about that at all. So. Absolutely, well, Mr. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And as I say, I may be barking up the wrong tree. There may be a good reason for this, but I haven't been able to think about it yet. Um, so thank you. All righty. Any other discussion of this item? Any other questions or discussion of this item? If not, um, we need one motion here, which we to repeal the local historic landmark designation, and I'll accept a motion on that item. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second to repeal the local historic designation. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote.
Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Let me just also say, I think I forgot to say, and I want to declare this public hearing closed. I want to declare this public hearing closed. And now we took a vote, okay? Thank you so much. Sorry about that. We'll now move to item 24. Uh, and this is the United, United, Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment Tree Coverage and Landscaping Revisions. And uh, I will uh, we'll now hear a report from staff. Good evening. I'm Scott Whiteman with the Planning Department. Good evening. Okay. Text Amendment TC-1805 is a series of changes to the Unified Development Ordinance intended to increase the preservation of existing trees and to minimize the effects of mass grading. Some of the key provisions in this UDO amendment include increasing the instances where natural project boundary buffers are required and incentivizing the use of natural rather than planted buffers in other circumstances, increased buffer width requirements in the suburban tier along rights of way and when mass grading is used in residential developments, change tree coverage requirements in the suburban tier to require preservation of existing trees and only allow replacement planting when there are not enough existing trees on the site to meet the, the requirement, increased tree, recover, tree coverage requirements for all uses in the urban tier and require one additional tree planting on every residential lot at the time of construction. In addition to these changes, the Planning Department, in conjunction with the General Services and Public Works Departments, has committed to working with Trees Durham to develop a pilot program for new streets in the suburban tier in which street trees would be required in the right-of-way. This will be brought to Council as a separate UDO amendment in the near future. Staff recommends approval. The Planning Commission recommended approval by a vote of 10 to 1 at their February meeting. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. We have now heard the report from staff, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open, and I'm going to first ask, are there any questions for staff by members of the council? Just one. Mm -hmm. In the hiring of the arborists to review the landscaping plans, will there be any review around maintaining um, or addressing maintenance that may not have occurred on trees and um, I want to say like all of the crawl, like the planting that's invading and crawling across the sidewalks. And So say that the, the arborist to review plans would only be affecting new developments where new trees are proposed. I'll say one of the reasons why we're recommending that we do a pilot program uh, for new streets is because um, Creating a street section which is wide enough so that the trees can fit in the right of way and can survive in the right of way and are, there's not conflicts with all the utilities underneath uh, is critical for for the health of the trees and for the future maintenance costs for the city. I would just add that it might be helpful to review what is currently the the tree situation, I would say, in East Durham, and recognizing that there are many trees that are that are much larger and. In that review, if there are some that are brought forward, like if there are some that are identified, if we could, if we could find a way to address it, that would be helpful. Certainly. And I know it's not in planning, but in going through a kind of evaluating along the way. We can certainly investigate that. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Freeman, I see uh, folks here from General Services who I think might be able to address that, and maybe I could ask the, if I, I'll, I believe that we have a current survey of trees in the right of way and their condition, and a, a citywide. And I wondered if uh, if if you all uh, would like to comment on that. Kevin Lilly, Department of General Services, and yes, sir, we do have a a current uh, inventory of our trees and a canopy study that identified trees throughout the entire city of Durham with a concentrated inventory in the downtown and neighborhoods outside of that bullseye uh, for the city itself. We are actively managing the trees uh, in East Durham as well as throughout the rest of the city. Some of the issues that uh, Councilman Freeman has addressed are being looked at right now with a tree removal contract and a stump grinding contract that will also take care of the trees that are infiltrating the sidewalks and causing issues for egress. Is removal the only option? 
In some cases, yes. Uh, we have worked with Public Works. Ed Venable was uh, key in developing a plan that looked at floating sidewalks, uh, sand over top of the existing base, and concrete over top of that to preserve root systems. In many cases, with the willow oaks that have simply aged beyond what we can actively manage, uh, removal and replacement is our next best option. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lilly, and thank you for the question. Council Mayor Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I thank my colleague. I want to associate myself with Councilor uh, Freeman's comments. Uh, I, I intend on supporting um, uh, the text amendments tonight, um, but I do want to go on record, Mr. Mayor, saying that uh, oftentimes the, the, one of the predicates of expanding our tree, tree uh, canopy is, is equity um, in our city and making sure that underserved areas and, and poor areas have a tree canopy. And just to, to, to dovetail on Councilor Freeman's uh, comments, the other, just this week, this past week on Wednesday, I was walking on Holloway Street at night with some local activists there between Guthrie and Miami, and literally at some areas on the sidewalk had to walk onto the street because the roots were just buckling the sidewalk and it was incredible overgrowth in one of the neighborhoods that we often cite as part of our equity uh, motivation for our tree program. I'm going to support this, but, but I, and, and I, I thank my counselor and colleague for bringing this up, but if we're going to be citing these areas as the reason why we need to include, uh, include our tree canopy, then we need to be very aggressive in making sure that these areas are serviced uh, with the trees that they already have. Um, the sidewalks are virtually impa impassable on Holloway between Guthrie uh, and Miami. Uh, so while I'm excited about uh, these text amendments, I, I, I would be very much interested in, in our timeline and, and our plan of attack on, on the trees that are already uh, impacting these neighborhoods that we cite as part of our equity concerns. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, any other questions at this point by members of the Council for staff? Okay. Uh, we have one person that has signed up to speak on this item, and that is Katie Rose Levin. Ms. Levin, uh, welcome. Ms. Levin, welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. Hello again. Katie Rose Levin, 4110 Cobblestone Place. Uh, first, I wanted to acknowledge all of the citizens who have come here to support these amendments and have been working hard with staff. If y'all could stand up. Uh, we have more coming, but last time we were last, we didn't talk until 1030, so uh, <laughs> appreciate coming early. Uh, first off, I really want to thank the council, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, for their work in supporting this and uh, asking staff to bring it back for a second round of revisions. So thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank staff. We've been working very closely with um, all of planning with um, Kevin and Gina in their office, as well as others, to come up with something that is um, a very good step forward. So we do want this round to be supported and then go for the next step, which will include preservation in commercial spaces as well as a street tree plan. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the issues that we're experiencing now. When the trees were originally planted, we planted Great Danes in kind of apartment spaces. So they're breaking stuff. They're getting in um, conflicted with power lines. They're breaking sidewalks. And one of the things that we're hoping to do with planning is to create a streetscape where we're putting small trees where there are small spaces and big trees where there are big spaces. So that will not only make it easier for maintenance, but it'll prevent walking issues and it will make things safer for people who are walking and people who are biking. So that is part of the street plan that we look forward to uh, seeing and developed through the planning department. The second is the preservation piece. We need both forest and trees, just like we're working to balance um, and take care of folks who are here and folks who are coming. We need to be really deliberate about preserving the forests are here, as well as appropriately planting the trees that are coming, right? Forests do a lot for us. We've had a lot of flooding because of the rains. Forests help prevent flooding. The more forests we remove, the more flooding we're going to experience. And you see that particularly in areas that are downstream or low-lying. 
the forests are like sponges that absorb the water. As we get more development and we lose more forests, we're gonna have more flooding. So that's one reason to preserve our trees. The other and the reason why there's some urgency to get this done is that uh, you can't replant a forest effectively. You can only replant trees. So we really are trying to um, keep all the benefits of the forest while we have them. And then when the comprehensive plan comes, we can do something comprehensively. So holding on to what we got until we decide what we're gonna do with it is the idea here. Uh, so we are available to help support with any questions and we just wanna say thank you very much and we hope you support this, but ask for, uh, give a clear deadline for the next steps. Thank you very much, Ms. Levin. Are there any other uh, people here now who, um, if, if, if you all are gonna come in, please come in and take a seat and don't hold a sign in front of anyone else. If you're gonna be in the room, please come take a seat and please don't hold a sign up in front of anyone else's view. Come on in. Uh, I have another person who has signed up to speak on this item, Maisel, Maple Osterbrink. Ms. Osterbrink, welcome. Thank you. you have three minutes. Oh, okay. I went to Miss Katie's Trees Durham event. It was wonderful, and I'm all for trees for sure. But I had one little concern over time about solar panels, and I'm really, you know, into that and making sure that our climate, as you guys are also into that and aware. Anyway, I just wanted to put it out there about um, solar panels being able to get as much sun as they need, and I'm not sure about the, I've read some of the ordinance and the proposal about the trees. I didn't read every sentence of every part of the document. I might have, and I skimmed a bunch of it, but I'm not sure if there's any rules about over time not being able to cut down trees, like restrictions, you may not cut down trees. And if someone has finally is able to afford solar panels in this Duke monopoly state and make it worth their while to finally have their solar panels, I want it to be able to be get that sunlight and not be have it blocked by a tree and not be able to not cut down a tree and not have solar energy because of the trees. That's all I wanted to put out there, I don't know what exactly to do or say, but that's Thank you. my concern. Thank, Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to comment on this item? Is there anyone else here in the public who would like to comment on this item? This is a public hearing item. All right, I'm gonna now ask uh, if there are any other ca uh, questions uh, or comments by members of the council. Mr. Mayor, I had one. Council Member ha yeah. Caballera. And uh, I thought this came up and I can't find it, but what was the final on native planning? Like what's going to be the focus on what we plant? So the planning department does have a landscape manual that yeah. applies to all required plantings. Um, it doesn't exclusively require native plantings, but it is designed so that any uh, exotics are not invasive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whiteman, um, on page four of the memo at the top, Am I to understand that the lower opacity requirement and the lower canopy coverage requirement in the buffer area is intended to encourage the use of the natural buffer? That's correct. So if the natural buffer is not used, what are the opacity and canopy coverage requirements? Are they the old ones? They are the old ones, yes. Okay. And can you explain what the ordinance will do to protect specimen trees? I wasn't uh, entirely clear about what the changes are. So we didn't make any significant changes to the specimen tree requirements. Basically what the ordinance requires is that if uh, in an area where tree preservation or a buffer is required, there, a specimen tree exists, then you must preserve that specimen tree. Okay, so no, no changes in that regard. Okay. That's right. We, did, we made it clear that you do have to actually preserve the tree. Yeah, okay, I see, thank you. All righty, uh, any other questions for staff or members of the council? It would, it would probably be helpful to just kind of address the question that the uh, resident raised and just making sure that we are accounting for solar panels having a sunlight. It's certainly, so this would, currently there's one street tree required for each residential lot. 
this would require an additional tree planting somewhere on the lot, and it would allow it to be an understory tree, which means a shorter one, um, with only two trees required that should leave plenty of room for solar access. So uh, before we uh, close the public hearing, I wanted to uh, raise a couple of issues that we have heard from our public and have given me uh, concern as well, and those are uh, the issues of the fact that we're uh, not requiring tree preservation during commercial development, and we're still not requiring developers to plant street trees. And I'm wondering where we are on uh, the, the thinking around that, uh, and what is the department's plan uh, for moving forward on considering those things, uh, if there is such a plan. So the commercial development does require uh, tree preservation. It's just less than residential development at the moment and is not required preservation. Um, and the, along with requiring the street trees be in the right of way, those will be in the, uh, we, we can and will address those in the uh, subsequent text amendment that we'll be bringing you sometime in the near future, probably by next summer. So it, uh, I'm just, just to be clear, Will both of, will both will the street trees be addressed in the text amendment, and will there also be commercial um, co uh, tree preservation in commercial development also in that same text amendment? There definitely will be no. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Young. Did you want to comment further? I wanted to just uh, elaborate slightly and clarify um, what Mr. Whiteman said, which is of course correct, but. Um, the text amendment that comes to you will allow us to do a pilot to do a cross-section that will allow street trees in with um, not conflict with utilities, sidewalks, and other built infrastructure components. Um, deploying street trees citywide is definitely an aspirational goal uh, that we as a department have, and I think um, the city and m many of our residents have, um, but de deploying it citywide is, is definitely going to be a resource issue in terms of a, a new level of commitment to uh, maintenance. Um, there's also liability issues that go along with that. So we want to study that further before it goes community-wide. So I don't want to over uh, set expectations unduly high. We definitely want to get towards that um, outcome. We share that. Um, we've worked very closely with the advocates for about two years on almost before you tonight. Um, but before uh, we want to do the uh, get the pilot authorized in law do the pilot, and then go from there. It let you all assess the impacts, uh, particularly the fiscal impacts, if that, if that makes sense. Thank you. We will look forward to that, it sounds like approximately next summer, uh, so sort of six to seven months from now, roughly. Okay. Uh, and um, I just want to uh, say that I think this is very important. Uh, I continue to think that uh, we are, our, our, the preservation of our tree canopy and the equitable distri distribution of trees in our city uh, continues to be, I believe, a very high priority. Uh, and this, what, you're, what you presented tonight is a really big step forward. And I want to thank the staff. I also want to thank the uh, folks from Trees Durham and others who have worked so hard on this. This is a big step forward, and uh, I think that we're going to be well served by the text amendments tonight. But I do still think we have some work to do uh, in terms of preservation of trees during commercial development, as well as how we're going to handle street trees. And I look forward to your usual thoughtful consideration of those issues. So thank you so much, and again, thank you uh, to the folks who are here tonight and who have been such good advocates on this. This is an important quality of life issue for us. <laughs> Don't clap. We haven't passed it yet. <laughs> if I'm All right. Add, Mr. Mayor. Uh, other comments? Just a, House Member Freeman. Just a note, just a side note that we might want to have some of this conversation on our legislative agenda as well because I noticed that mass grading is at four acres and I was wondering if maybe we could... Um, look at how we might be able to have some impact in making sure that there's more natural grading that occurs in large developments that are over four acres. Thank you, we, we will put that on, uh, uh, we will put that on our agenda for consideration, thank you. Okay, um, 
So we got two agenda items for our legislative agendas tonight. All right, I'm going to um, now ask if there if there are any other questions or comments by members of the council. If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. And uh, to pass this, we will need two motions. The first to adopt the appropriate consistency statement. Move, Move to adopt. We moved and second we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 7 0. Second. The second motion is to adopt an ordinance amending the United Unified Development Ordinance. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Will the adopt the ordinance amending the UDO? Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you so much. All righty, and thank you all for those who came tonight. Uh, and now, um, uh, not on our agenda, but I have, uh, uh, at the request of some of our uh, employees, I have uh, agreed to let two employees uh, of Parks and Rec speak tonight. And if they would please come forward over here to my right, that would be great. And I'll just let you all know that Charlie... Reese is standing up because he's uh, got an injury. And uh, so if he's walking around, just know he's trying to be here to listen to you. Okay, each of you all has three minutes, welcome. And if uh, you could come, uh, the, whoever wants to go first, please come up, state your name and address. Uh, we're glad to hear, have you here and you have three minutes. Good evening, my name is Kelly McLean and I'm a recreation specialist with the city of Durham. Um, I've held this position for about three years full time, and previous to that, I've worked with the city um, over 13 years part time with various programming. I've also been a Durham Public Schools educator for 13 years, working with special needs individuals ages 5 to 22 years of age. I come from a long line of educators in my family, and I take great pride and responsibility in educating the youth that I impact every day. I'm here this evening because there is a great need for a fair grievance policy with the City of Durham employees. I personally have been affected by it not being a policy, by, um, excuse me, by being wrongfully evaluated and disciplined without a fair say with my management team as well as with HR. Things keep getting turned back over to the department and from there, a constant hostile work environment has been created. A heavier workload for myself compared to my other coworkers has been placed on me, as well as things that are not being asked of others. This has created a very, very stressful environment for me, as well as previous employees that we have had and actually lost due to this type of management style. And with this management style, we have had a eroding of employees that have left within the past two years, at least 11 full-time staff members. Um, the management style has basically retaliated anytime someone had a complaint or was coming to uh, speak with management for concern. Um, I'm here because this has caused sleepless nights, several doctor's appointments for myself, others is causing insomnia, nightmares, and to go speak to therapists for the type of retaliation that we are dealing with on a daily basis. And we're asking that this type of behavior be looked into by the Human Rights Commission and the Workers' Rights Commission to come in and do a thorough investigation and hear the complaints of the current employees and the previous who love doing their job working with children of various ages. And that is what I come to to speak to you about this evening. Um, personally, I would it would really impact me as well as the department if someone would come in and actually uh, do a thorough investigation. There are a lot of programs that are at risk because we're understaffed, and the current staff that's there are constantly being asked to work several hours without lunch breaks. I see there's about my time, so I wanted to say thank, thank you, you and I hope this is taken into consideration. Thank you for being here. Hi. Would you give us your name and address? And you also have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Chandler Musson. I am of 155 Sand Trap Lane in Pilot Mountain. Um, but I am a former uh, recreation specialist with Durham Parks and Recreation. I was in the school age care unit. Um, I was stationed out at Holton Resource Center from April 29th, 2019 
until June 26, 2019. Um, I resigned the position on June 26 and offered to work out my two weeks notice. This was because of gross mismanagement, incompetence, uh, constant toxic pressure, as well as dangerous situations that I was forced to place my staff and my campers in. Um, <clears throat> for example, we had exorbitant ratios. The American Camp Association does not re um, recommend any higher than 2 to 25. However, we were forced to do 1 to 15, which not only is higher than 2 to 25, but it allows, um, it forces people to be individually in a group and does not allow uh, individuals to deal with any sort of problems that come up. For example, I had a child elope from a group and the council had to make the choice of do I stay with these 14 children or do I go after the child that's running off and is in distress. Um, <coughs> the, these types of guidelines, um, we need to follow camp guidelines as opposed to daycare guidelines. We do not have the admin or support staff. Many of the staff are in group, even the full-time staff are in group with children five, six, seven hours a day. We do not have the ability to go and help other um, participants. This also creates issues because um, Staff is unable to go to the restroom or attend any sort of personal need while on the clock. Um, staff training is inadequate, inadequate at best. There is no written policies. Every time we asked for written policies, we were not given one. Um, my staff reported to me that they felt infantilized and demoralized at every single staff training meeting. And any time we were allowed to speak individually to our staff members, we were forced to stick to a strict outline that we had to practice beforehand. Um, workload is physically impossible to keep up with the um, demands of a full-time job when you have 15 campers that you are responsible for for seven hours of your day. And <clears throat> unfortunately, that becomes disciplinary issues because we cannot keep up with our workload because we cannot be with the campers and do what, we're, what is expected and needed to run a camp. Um, lack of supplies. I had no medication lockbox for several days in my camp. This forced me to leave Ritalin unlocked in my desk with my supervisor's knowledge uh, for multiple days and was unable to um, do anything to prevent potential of it being stolen. Um, we ended up with uh, just waste of money in terms of they, when we did get supplies, they were duplicate things that we already had, whereas we, anything that we actually needed, we couldn't get. Um, let's see, I had a suicidal camper and I was left by myself for two hours without any sort of backup and was unable, was forced to put them into group and told not to fill out an incident report afterwards. Um, thank you for your time, and I appreciate you listening, and I hope you will take into consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, Deputy City Manager Ferguson if he has any comments at this point. The mayor only to update you that uh, the uh, union submitted uh, this request on September 25th that's been passed out in front of you. The city manager received that. Uh, the city manager launched an investigation on that day uh, involving staff from the city manager's office and from human resources. At this time, that investigation is ongoing, and as is our practice and policy, we're not going to talk about uh, personnel matters in a public setting, uh, and I'll defer to the city manager to provide counsel and update as to the outcome of that discussion and that process. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. We take what you said very seriously, uh, as I'm sure uh, Deputy City Manager Ferguson does as well. Uh, we are, uh, it's very, very important that all of our employees be treated with the utmost respect and supported in a way that they can do the job that they need to be doing, um, those who are dealing with our children and those who are doing any kind of job in the city. So we're grateful for you all being here. We're grateful for you all, uh, the words that you brought to us. We take it very seriously. So thank you. Uh, I did want to make an exception to hear you all tonight, and I appreciate you being here. All right, thank you very much. It's now 8.33, and I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you.